Okay, lecture six, chapter nine, Joyce Chaplin's um, essay on uh, race. Okay, so um, Chaplin begins with a concept that is, I think when she wrote it, it was a little bit more uh, difficult to explain, but I think in today's world, we're a little bit more open to it. And that's one that uh, the issue of race is something um, that is, um, there's a spectrum uh, and is much more plastic uh, than people, let's say a generation ago thought, right? So um, she wants to talk about this idea of race and, and it's something that's a challenge for anybody uh, in history is the ability to leave behind the world and what you know today and put yourself in the shoes of people in the past and try and leave those um, ideas that um, of the past that, that um, you you know about and leave them behind and see things through the eyes of people at that time. So um, as we shall see, Chaplin's talking about how this idea of race uh, and racism is something that is created uh, as a function of this Atlantic world. And so that the people in the past didn't have the same ideas of racial distinction that we um, uh, come to, uh, that have come to infect our thinking today. Uh, and so what she says is that racism today is a creation of the Atlantic world. It's a function of the Atlantic world and those things that come together that create this, this idea or this conception of viewing people as distinct races based upon their physical appearance. Uh, and this, this creation of the Atlantic world is driven uh, by a, a, and the intertwining of a couple different things, um, one of which is slavery and modernity. So as we saw before, slavery is an old practice, uh, but it's this creation of um, the modern uh, system of slavery in the Atlantic world that creates uh, a sort of uh, structure that lends itself to the creation of racial distinction. So what Chaplin argues is that slavery and modernity the fact that this Atlantic slave system in its particular formation, in its particular locations develops during the modern world also leads, lends itself to the creation of a, a vision of racial distinction. It's also a function of colonization. Uh, the colonizers uh, are uh, dominating uh, foreign lands with people uh, in which they are also bringing in another set of people to do uh, work there in the form of slavery. And so colonization is a system of domination um, by one set of folks over another. And because the lands that these Europeans go out and colonize are peopled with people uh, who look markedly different in a physical sense, um, at least to the eyes of Europeans, it lends itself to this sort of creation of uh, a shared identity based upon physical characteristics and a shared distinction uh, how they don't, other people don't fit into it. Uh, and in this particular case, the English, who are the ones we're talking about in the formation of this British Atlantic world, uh, they're late to the party. So there's already a system uh, that is in place, that's put in place by people from the Iberian Peninsula, Spaniards and Portuguese. Um, and so the British, they're not creating a system uh, de nova. Um, they're actually uh, taking uh, some of the relations that have been established by the, the um, Portuguese and the Spaniards, uh, and then they're also extending it in their own particular ways. <coughs> Excuse me, one of the things they're drawing upon is the view of Africans uh, and the views of Native Americans that were already set in place by uh, what the Spaniards and Portuguese were doing. What Chaplin says is um, something I don't think is uh, radical to us today, but was um, maybe not as widely um, held uh, when she wrote this particular chapter, uh, in that race is an evolving category. Uh, it's not something that's set in stone in which you fit into different ra racial categorizations. It's something that is plastic, that is changes over time. Uh, and what she's going to talk about in this essay is that it, it wasn't something that existed in the way that we think about racism today or racial distinctions. It's something that was created as a result of this system. So they, uh, they're intertwined in a sense. Um, and so Chaplin says that race was largely uh, unconsidered in earlier ages. It's not that they didn't have uh, notions of who is or uh, superior or who is inferior. Uh, 
uh, it's it was that the the distinctions between uh, folks who elevate themselves over others were not based upon the physical characteristics of what we would call race today. Um, so even though these they conquered other folks or uh, colonized other places and subdued the the people to work for them, they didn't see them as inferior because of their physical characteristics. They were inferior for some reason or another. She cites the example of where we get the term barbarians, right? Barbarians is a term that we think of um, people who are barbarians are savage, less civilized, they're, they're, um, you know, they're not equal to us. And it comes from uh, a Greek mocking of the way other people who didn't speak Greek spoke. So they said their language sounded like ba ba, um, to the ears of the Greeks, and so the Greeks considered themselves civilized, erudite, um, and other people inferior in which they, you know, their inferiority was manifest in their uh, harsh languages, which were a distinction of their lesser civilization, as it were. Uh, so there certainly was distinctions made between peoples, uh, but that largely these distinctions, uh, as we saw previously in, in uh, previous discussions in this book uh, were largely based on civil or class status, right? Your stature is determined uh, by where you are born, right? This is what defines you. And you can see how it wouldn't support a, a concept of racial distinctions because um, if you're born to nobility or you're born to the peasant class, you're still the same type of people. You don't have physical uh, distinctions between the two, you're all the same people, so you have to have a, come up with some other reason uh, why you are superior and other people are inferior. And so uh, they say it's you're born into royal status or aristocratic status. These are things that are a marker of why you're superior. And so they certainly uh, have mistreatment of folks, but they don't think about it as a physical manifestation of characteristics. Right. Uh, now that said, there is the sort of beginning stages or the, uh, the seed kernel of what becomes uh, racial distinctive ideas uh, that we call racism uh, in some previous examples, and one of which is uh, in Spain, right? So we talked previously about the Reconquista. Uh, the Reconquista is uh, uh, the forcible reconquering of the Spanish uh, Iberian Peninsula uh, by evicting uh, Moors and Jews uh, from that territory to reestablish uh, Catholic Spanish control. As we've seen, it's a very intolerant process. You carry the sword uh, for conquest uh, and the cross for forcible conversion if need be. Uh, and so some folks who, you know, you were either you were given the sword or you were booted out uh, or you were given the opportunity to convert. And some folks stayed and converted and they were referred to in Spanish history uh, as the conversios. So the conversios are people, Jews in particular, um, who converted to Catholicism because the, the Spanish rulers or the Spanish church uh, gave them uh, no other option. So uh, this, this conversion process uh, always made these folks in the eyes of the Spanish a little bit suspect. And this can the conversios it extended beyond just you know the people who, who you know converted at that time it extended to their children and their grandchildren as well which carried with it this concept that there is something about the conversios that would be passed on to the next generation which they attributed to the blood right so you have these sort of blood distinctions you know, they have Jewish blood in them, their conversios are suspect, they were Moors or Jews or something. Uh, so they're suspect because it's something that's passed on as part of their inheritance. So you begin to see this idea of, uh, of distinctions forming in this sort of idea in Spain as, in, as a result of the Reconquista. Uh, you also see it in the Mediterranean system where, as we saw the plantation, the Atlantic plantation system, which began in the Mediterranean areas as a result of uh, the Europeans coming in contact with this system of uh, sugar production on plantations, worked by gang slave labor. On those plantations, it was a multi-ethnic uh, slave population. So um, 
if it was owned by uh, uh, someone um, who is uh, Islamic, then they may have Christians and uh, Jews or Africans or uh, prisoners or whatever people working on it. When the the uh, Christian kingdoms took it over, they may have uh, Moors on there. They could have Africans. They could have Jews. Um, you know, other folks. So this multi-ethnic slave labor force, um, as we saw, it it moves out of the Mediterranean and then it moves. The system is installed on the islands off the coast of Africa. When it's installed in the islands off the coast of Africa, that multi-ethnic slave force becomes exclusively uh, African slave source, right? Because that's where they're purchasing the labor. So those sugar plantations, um, the plantations growing wine uh, on Madeira, uh, worked by uh, gang slave labor, it's increasingly becoming purely African. And when that system is transported across the Atlantic Ocean by the Portuguese and the Spanish, they establish plantation systems which rely upon uh, African slaves after the disappearance of Native populations, Native American populations. So increasingly you have locked into place uh, slave status as a function of being African, which carries with it physical characteristics, right? Uh, so that sort of um, idea that Africans are being locked into a position of slavery as a slave labor force is becoming locked into sort of concepts about what you would think they would do. So um, as we also discussed, one of the things that kind of challenged uh, the, the philosophical or religious worldview is, uh, is all the things that weren't um, understood uh, to be part of biblical description. Right, so in the Adam and Eve story, if we're all descended from Adam and Eve, uh, then you know there are no racial distinctions, right? We're all descendants from Adam and Eve in that sort of philosophical worldview. But one of the responses to the, the challenges, the intellectual, religious, cultural challenges, philosophical challenges of the discovery of the new world and all the things never before seen is that some folks uh, gravitate to the idea of polygenesis. Right, so that there's an um, Adam and Eve who form uh, the basis of Europeans, but maybe there was Adam and Eve or other creations that uh, were made for the Native Americans, right? So even though the idea, the concept of polygenesis doesn't stick, the idea of other peoples created for inferior status or subordinate status does stick, right? And so what the Spanish New World experienced, they begin to, they create a template, a way of seeing the world in which you have uh, on one end of the scale, Native Americans uh, who, as we have seen from Crosby, uh, are dying out, right? And so the Spaniards, uh, Europeans get this idea that the Native peoples are inherently weak, right? And so there are weak people uh, who are do, doomed to be supplanted by the superior people of um, the uh, Spanish or, or Europeans, right? And then you have the Africans. Africans are uh, folks you work in uh, bondage. Uh, they uh, survive in um, terrible circumstances. You work them hard. And it's because it's seen that their status, they're only suitable for work, right? So they're strong. They got strong backs. Uh, but they're not suitable for rule because they lack, uh, they're on the wrong end of the slavery discussion. Right, so uh, they must be inferior because they're slaves, and so in that, then the Spanish sit themselves uh, in the middle. They're not, you know, they're stronger than the native peoples, but they're not as strong, uh, insensibly strong as the Africans. Um, so they kind of sit in the middle, and they're the ones who are um, uh, destined to be the ruling class, as it were. Right. So, move too fast there. Um, so. When the British come into the system, it's a system that's already running, right? So they're relatively late to the party. Um, so when they come, that, that sort of relationship between various sets of folks, uh, Africans are there for labor, right? They're slaves. Uh, that's what they're there to do. Uh, and that's how they're incorporated in the system. The Native peoples, um, you know, the, the vision of the Native peoples, that's a whole story unto itself, how it uh, how it's viewed by Europeans, but um, the 
they're either seen tragically that they're, you know, they're the interesting noble people who are going to be pushed aside because they're too weak, uh, or they're seen as they're, you know, they're going to be pushed aside because they're weak and there's no tragic element to it, right? But this, there's this idea that these um, native peoples uh, are um, going to be pushed aside and that their, their, their property, their land, their world is going to be taken over by superior people uh, who the British are the ones to see themselves. It's their job to take this over. They're uh, destined to do so by God, uh, and they're going to put inferior people's Africans to work, right? Uh, so uh, what Chaplin argues is that this is a process that evolves, right? It's not something you pick up one day that you start seeing racial distinction, that it's a process that evolves. And, and there's a perfect example of this in the case of Jamestown. Uh, Jamestown was a colony that in its initial first almost two decades, uh, they were continually plagued by the problem of uh, having a very uh, harsh starving period. Um, they anticipated that native peoples would bring them lots of goodies uh, during the winter, so they didn't uh, do a lot of uh, crop growing. Um, you also had a system in which you had uh, the adventurers who are from uh, sort of noble birth, right? So they're the second, third sons um, who don't stand to inherit the property either in Ireland or in the British uh, home isles. Um, and so they go out to make their fortune, but they're from the upper sorts, right? And so they're adventurers, they're investors, they're hoping to make a fortune, and they're not coming here to work. And so there's a small number of them, and then they're bringing a lot of the lesser sorts as they saw them, the meaner sorts who are gonna do all the physical labor, right? Uh, and so uh, they're hoping to get rich in the colony. Everybody's hoping to get rich. Uh, but every year there was a, a harsh period in which you know food was very scarce. People would starve to death. The conditions were miserable. And they hoped that a ship would arrive from, uh, from England bringing supplies or that they would survive the winter season and then they would be able to get some plants in the ground and maybe go out and do some hunting, whatever, uh, and survive it. But during that long stretch of the winter into the late spring, uh, uh, early to late spring, it was a starving season. People uh, were out of food, right? Uh, and so um, you have a case of the thief in Jamestown. Uh, I think it's about 1607, maybe 1609, somewhere in that range. Um, this story comes from uh, Alan Taylor's American Colony. So uh, this thief was caught stealing a pint of oatmeal from uh, the common stores, right? The food that's there for the entire fort. He was caught stealing a pint of oatmeal for himself. So when he was captured, um, he's a part of the lower sorts as they see it, right? He's a, from the, the, the peasant class, the meaner sort. Uh, so he's going to be punished. And his punishment is particularly telling. He is chained to a post in the center of the fort, and then a long steel pin is inserted through his tongue so he can't eat. And he starves to death in front of everybody else in the fort. And it's a sign of this is what happens to people who steal here, right? The lesser sorts who steal. This is a, a sentence in, uh, designed to terrify everybody else in his social status. Uh, this is what happens if you try and break out against the system, right? You would never see that sort of treatment to a white person a century later. You would see it in the early 1600s because he's seen as an inferior person because he's from the lower class, right? Um, you would never see that treatment 100 years later to somebody who's a white or a descendant of white Europeans but you would see that type of treatment meted out to a slave. Because the idea behind it is to terrorize the other people, that these are lesser sorts um, who need to be uh, the threat of violence and terror to keep them in place, right? Somewhere between 1607 and let's say 1707, where it would be um, unimaginable that that type of treatment would be meted out to a white colonist. Um, something happens, and some of it happens around Bacon's Rebellion, right? But it's a process that unfolds. So in Bacon's Rebellion, uh, as we talked about last uh, lecture, uh, 
uh, you have this revolution, it's a class-based revolution, right, where the, the uh, ruling class in the uh, Chesapeake colonies, Virginia and the Carolinas, are preventing the poorer class from expanding out uh, and taking land from the Native Americans, right? And so this rebellion breaks out, and it's a class war, and it's, it's snuffed out uh, by the arrival of the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines who put an end to it. But in the aftermath of that, there's something given back to the, um, the lesser sorts, right? There's a recognition that they're not being treated fairly in this system. And so you have this creation of uh, a shared white identity, right? So even though you're the lower sorts, you're above these other folks, these Native Americans, or these African slaves, right? So one of the difficulties about, you know, tracing how this process evolves is that uh, we can see where the process, the end point of the process uh, occurs because you see things captured in legislation. And legislation is really useful uh, for historians and for other people to look back because it tells us two things. It tells us either one, things people are afraid of happening, and so they put things, codify it in law to prevent it from happening, or two things that are going on that you want to stop, right? So you put it into law where you use the power of the state to, to force something to end, right? And so it's at that late uh, 17th uh, into the early 17 or into the early 18th century, so the late 1600s into the early 1700s, where you have passages of laws that tell us something about they're codifying things to, to ensure distinction. It became illegal in the Virginia colonies for uh, a master to marry his slave, right? Uh, it's codified as a function of law. You could not do so, right? That tells us that now they're, dis uh, they're making distinctions. While at the same time, it was not illegal for a master to rape a slave, right? So you're criminalizing behavior you don't want to occur. Um, you don't, the, the state is mandating that you cannot marry a slave. This is um, putting things in law. It, it tells us something about where they are at that time in, in the turn of the uh, 18th century. Uh, but we know that there is a, a period where this transition occurred, right? So we have the, uh, the thief in Jamestown getting treatment. We would see a slave get 100 years later. Uh, but we also have you know, the first appearance of, uh, in the records of African slaves arriving in the Virginia colonies in 1619. Uh, but uh, what their status was is not completely clear. We don't know exactly if they were seen in the same way as indentured servants, right, that they fulfill a term and then they're, they're uh, given their freedom, uh, whether or not they're seen as a penal uh, indentured servant where they get a longer time frame, but with the idea that at some point their slave status is going to change, right, just as your indentured to would change. We don't know. Uh, because it's not clear because the the records and the and the laws don't speak to it, which tells us that there was this was not set in place. But when you get to the end of the 1600s, you're beginning to see these things codified that tell us that now we're seeing the distinctions. And one of the things that uh, some historians point to is this Bacon's Rebellion, where you have the creation of a shared white identity, which includes with it a separation of other folks, Africans and Native Americans because of their physical distinctions, right? So when you see these things put in place, it tells us something. There's also things that are absent in the laws that tell us about that. Um, there, there's very little in uh, the English Atlantic world about um, the legal status of the offspring of uh, Europeans and Africans, or Europeans and Native Americans. Uh, we see a lot of these things, uh, formally and informally discussed in other places. Um, the French, uh, the Spanish, uh, the Portuguese, they have things codified whether or not your father was a European and your, uh, your mother was a slave or vice versa, or if your grandparents, whatever, your status, some of your, what are your rights are a result of who your parentage is. There isn't that sort of distinction made in the British colony, not because they're high-minded and enlightened, but they refuse to uh, countenance the idea that, um, that Europeans and Africans would be uh, having those sort of relationships, right? Uh, 
So there's, there's a refusal to recognize that. So it's not codified in the law because they believe if they put into law, then it's, you know, they're acknowledging that it, it could occur and they refuse to consider that because they're making these distinctions based upon where you are in society, your status as a function of your racial characteristics. So Chaplin uh, finishes or uh, completes his essay and, and uh, wants to bring up a concept that's sort of a term of art in history known as post-colonial. Post-colonial refers to uh, the colonial world when uh, either uh, those who were colonized uh, throw off this uh, yoke of colonial rule uh, and create you know, systems of their own government, or even if it's not formal, um, you know, removal of the, the colonizer's rule, but the sort of cultural and social norms that develop independent of colonial rule in which the, the colonized people, uh, you know, develop their own systems, their own ways of doing things, their own worlds, right? So post-colonial is about outside the colonial system. Uh, and Chaplin says that some historians talk about America, the United States, after the revolution as a post-colonial world. And she says this is misguided because even though the British rule is thrown off, the mindset of the British uh, vision in terms of race remain. Uh, so that whether you were a rebel um, looking to throw off British rule or a Tory looking to support it and keep it, or British yourself, uh, here to uh, impose order uh, was irrelevant, according to Chaplin, because they all shared the same sort of mindset of a race-based distinction of higher and uh, lower position. All right, so we'll stop there and we'll pick up uh, next time with our next lecture in Armitage and Redditch. Okay, Sean.